Our organ is known as Opus 414. That is the opus number that E.M. Skinner gave the organ when it was being built for installation and inauguration in 1924. Every organ builder gives its uh, organs a uh, opus number to keep, it, uh, keep track of which one is which. So we are Opus 414 of E.M. Skinner. There are 5,589 pipes in a three-story chamber directly above the chancel. And there is an antiphonal division in the northwest um, ceiling of the balcony, which has not been functioning for more than probably a decade. How many of you remember any sound coming out of that antiphonal division. An antiphonal division is a part of the organ that is usually at a remote um, area of the church, usually in the back or in the ceiling, to create some spatial contrast um, with the main organ, and that's exactly what we have. So we have the vast majority of the organ is here, but a small number of pipes are in the back in this antiphonal division. If you go up to the third floor um, and come in the, the door at the top of the balcony on the third floor, and if you look immediately to your right, you'll see the um, swell shades, the openings, the louvers that enclose the pipes of the antiphonal division. That has been silent for over a decade and probably longer. I don't have exactly um, uh, that, that information with me. So the organ is controlled currently by the third console. This is the third console since the organ was installed in 1924. Each keyboard, one, two, three, four, and the pedal board, which is its own keyboard played by the feet, control a separate set of pipes, some of which are enclosed in large wooden boxes. And that's what I was saying. This antiphonal division is in its own chamber that is um, uh, provided with these louvers, movable louvers, um, that create uh, expression, uh, volume, uh, for the pipes in that particular division. And just to remind everybody, the organ does not respond, the organ keyboards does not respond to differences in pressure. Unlike the piano, you hit a piano key harder, the hammer hits the strings harder, and you get a louder sound. On the organ, that doesn't happen. The only things we have at the organ for volume are combinations of stops, playing more notes at once, playing more pipes at once, and this capacity to create crescendo and diminuendo, and I'll explain this and demonstrate a little bit of this later. But these are the gas pedals here, if you will, for lack of a better word, here in the center of the console above the pedals. And those control the louvers on um, three divisions of the uh, organ. So um, we also have a massive wind blower in the basement of the church that supplies air under pressure to numerous bellows and reservoirs throughout the instrument um, above the chancel. To remind everyone this is not a machine, although there are many complex parts to it. It is a musical instrument unlike any other created by humankind probably the most improbable instrument in the entire world, a work of both visual and sonic art. Every Ill element of the instrument needs to be in optimal working order for it to do its job and to harmonize with other elements in the organ. We do have an unusual situation here in which the pipes, imagine 5,589 pipes that you cannot see up there. So many organs and many churches and concert halls can actually be seen. Some of the pipes are on display. Here we have none of that. We just have our grill work and our chamber um, behind it that houses all of these pipes. The organ is 97 and a half years old right now. The effects of time and several water leaks into the chamber over many decades have required a patchwork of repairs that currently render the organ at most 60% operable. 
Many necessary repairs to the organ cannot be effectively accomplished in place. The largest pipes and the wind mechanisms can only be removed for repair by removing the central grill work outside the organ chambers here above the chancel and taking out most of the organ, getting most of the organ out of the way so these large pipes and these large mechanisms can be removed. I should note that there is a small egress, ingress to the organ chamber in the stairway uh, between the second and the third floor in the uh, back here. And that is woefully inadequate to be able to do what we need to do. Its dimensions are approximately two feet by four feet. And it's elevated off the stairway by about three feet. So you have to sort of jump into the chamber and it's very inconvenient to get into. But more importantly, it's such a small opening that we can't get, again, all of the big pieces of the organ um, out and um, to the workshops where they need to be um, fully restored. The patchwork of repairs and temporary fixes throughout the instrument have left the organ out of tonal balance. At the moment, the organ is very bottom heavy. And I love bass, don't get me wrong, but it's out of balance with the treble. The entire organ needs to be revoiced and it's balanced between treble and bass restored. And that's hard to do because we have winding problems, we have speech problems on many, many pipes throughout the organ that are simply a function of age. So we can't do that effectively until we solve a variety of other mechanical problems. Many of the repairs and the updates to the organ in the 1980s were accomplished using what were at the time experimental materials being tested for the first time by organ builders um, around the country, hoping they would provide longevity and ease of maintenance to many parts of the organ. Unfortunately, time has proven that neither of these hopes was realized. All of these materials need to be renewed with more reliable and time-tested components. There are major leaks in the organ blower that must be addressed immediately. The platform on which the organ blower sits is made of 100-year-old horsehair. The horsehair has, of course, been compressed by the weight of the organ blower over a period of decades. But the compression of the horsehair platform has not been uniform. So, the blower tilts slightly to one side. This causes stress on the bearings of the blower motor and is causing premature aging of the blower motor. The motor has been renewed several times in the past, and it is time again to put the wind supply of the organ back on a solid foundation and to plug up the numerous leaks in the main bellows. The console is the cockpit of the organ. It controls every aspect of the instrument and should be custom designed so that the pilot, me, the organist, uh, can effortlessly control the functioning of the instrument with the greatest of ease and efficiency. The present console, we believe, was not originally designed for Opus 414. Rather, it appears to have been adapted for its present use from another project. And I can explain the details in the next segment of the presentation um, that will make that clear. Numerous difficulties persist as a, re a result of this adaptation. Furthermore, the present console uses modern digital technology to speak with the pipes in the organ chamber. Unfortunately, the mechanism in the organ chamber still uses outdated electrical circuits and connections that are not easily compatible with the more modern system present in the current console. Many pipes in the organ cannot maintain their tune because parts of the pipes are in need of repair. Until the repairs are made, the tuning of the organ will continue to be a significant problem. So that's a basic overview of the state of the organ. What I'd like to do now is point out several very specific um, examples of the things that I've just spoken about, and then um, there will be some times for uh, questions. 
probably the most recent and the biggest change in the organ took place the, uh, in the days immediately before Thanksgiving last fall, 2021. Um, I was in practicing preparing for our community Thanksgiving service on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and the solo division, all of the stops here, um, basically uh, lost its um, mechanism. We knew that this was coming for a long time, but all of a sudden 20 stops, 20, sorry, 20 pipes started screaming and screeching uncontrollably whether I was playing or not. So the wind had broken through the leather pallets and the wind was going into these notes uh, um, uh, spontaneously. So the day before the service, or the morning of the service, actually Wednesday morning of the community Thanksgiving service, we had to make a determination and we decided to cut off the air completely to that division because that's the only way we could get it to stop, certainly that morning. And the estimate would, uh, is of several tens of thousands of dollars to repair just that by itself. Um, so the solo division will not sound again. Um, it does not make economic sense. Uh, it does not make practical sense to do that when we're um, preparing to renovate the entire organ. What that means is some of the most colorful, some of the most uh, distinctive stops on the organ are now silent. Um, our tuba mirabilis, our French horn, our English horn, the big uh, celeste, these were all special stops that were championed by E.M. Skinner back in the um, 1920s and that for which he is uh, well known. Those are all silent now, um, as are uh, several other um, pipes and parts of the organ. I should say that the organ is large. This is a large um, instrument. It's one of the largest in the city. Um, but it is large not to blow us out of the sanctuary, but to provide color, to provide um, nuance, to, be, to supply refined sounds, particularly in accompanying voices and instruments. Um, this organ has amazing capacity, but we've lost a lot of that, and I'll continue to demonstrate that. As time goes on, the organ begins to sound very vanilla, um, not a lot of distinct, distinctive sounds. It still has a certain vol volume, um, but we have much more that we can be using and that we should be using. Another thing that has happened recently, and again, we don't always know what the genesis of these problems are whether they're mechanical or electronic. And the problem with chasing the electronic uh, problems is that it's a needle in a haystack. Uh, we have to locate the proper circuit. We have to locate the proper card. We have to find the soldering that may be loose or that there's a speck of dust in something. And it's, it's prohibitively expensive to go on that kind of fishing expedition for the number of um, problems and holes that we see. But um, within the last six months, uh, the choir division, which is another division, it's controlled by this keyboard here, has lost its ability to sing and to play um, F sharp or G flat. So there it is. It's, it's gone. So every stop on this um, keyboard is silent on that note. So on, in one way, the choir is completely incapable of complete flexibility of being able to play in any key in any register. So that's something that I have to play around. That's something that I have to avoid, among many other things, as I am playing. Let me um, talk to you a little bit about these swell shades that um, are controlled by these, what I call gas pedals, here in the middle. You can see them up here in the, in the corner of the screen. And when they're down, the louvers are closed. This one in the middle controls the 
swell shades, the louvers uh, around the stops in the swell division. That's controlled here by the third manual from the bottom, second manual from the top, and it sounds like this when it's completely open, and then when you close the boxes, the louvers, it goes away to that. Especially when you have more sound on, it doesn't go away as far as it needs to go away. It should be very muffled. That's as far as we can go. And while it is a contrast with being fully open, were the wood and the mechanism of the swell capable of closing down completely, we'd have a much more subtle um, sound uh, in that uh, uh, particular uh, place. So because of dried wood, because of warping me uh, mechanisms and worn out mechanisms, those uh, louvers are not able to close completely. So that's a compromise, again, not just with the swell, but also with the choir, and were the solo to be um, uh, functioning now, that would be the same, uh, the same thing. So the next thing I'd like to demonstrate to you is some gaps in some of the pedal um, stops. And I don't have time, and you don't want to stay here long enough for me to show you absolutely everything. Um, but the, these are representative, and they are um, uh, pervasive across the entire um, instrument. Uh, let's start with our Ophiclide. This is a stop that imitates a 19th century trombone, for lack of a better um, an uh, analogy. And it sounds deep and low, but subtle. There's a dead note, there's a dead note, there's a dead note, and there we have another one. Here's another dead note up here on G. A and F work, and G is gone. So if I add other stops while I am playing, so obviously it, it, it cannot function on its own. Um, so if you play are playing other stops with it, it sounds like this. Now it's going to go away, and hear the growl of the Ophiclide go away. Color changes, the bottom in some ways falls out, and then it's back in. So again, this happens over and over throughout the organ. Here's another um, demonstration of a similar thing. Our Untersatz, our 32-foot um, flute pipe is the lowest uh, sounding flute pipe in the organ. It gives that deep rumble that you hear, maybe hard to hear online. Here we go from up at the top. Here's F, E, E flat, D, C sharp, C, and now it's going to go away. It's gone here, it's gone here, and again, for musical applications, um, it doesn't sound very good when you're going back and forth, passing in and out of um, sounding of these pipes. So I'm going to add some other things as I did before. sounds here, feel the low notes, and now it's going to go away. The rumble stops, and then it returns. So we have these gaps um, all over the place that um, are, in total, uh, really, really compromise what you can do um, in using the organ in refined musical ways. Some of the problems with the organ are simply age and mechanical integrity of the pipes. My favorite one to demonstrate, which um, sounds like this. And you can say, okay, tune the organ, please, and uh, we'll all be happy. Well, the pipe can be tuned, but it goes immediately out of tune. And it is because the mechanism of the organ, of that pipe uh, in this organ is, is um, falling apart, basically. The wooden, um, wedge that goes into the reed is uh, deteriorating. It's uh, disintegrating. So it has a hard time holding 
the, the reed in place and the tuning wire in place. So as much as we tune it, it will go out of tune um, shortly thereafter. And again, there are many um, stops like that throughout the instrument. That's probably one of the most uh, dramatic. Um, but it will not change until that pipe and the entire rank, the entire set of pipes are taken out. They're given new parts, um, refreshed, and then they will keep their, keep their tune. The last thing I would like to point out before I take your questions is about our console. And I've indicated before that it does not seem as though this console was customized for this uh, organ. And just to continue the airplane analogy and the automobile analogy, you would never have an airplane cockpit that, <laughs> you know, a seven, 37 cockpit for a 777 um, airplane. Um, in fact, what we seem to have is we seem to have a 777 co a cockpit for a 737 a jet, if I can make that. Uh, it's, it's much larger than we actually need, and if, if you've looked at this carefully, um, it, it's hard to see it on everything on camera. Um, but this entire set of Pipe uh, stops here on my left is missing its uh, stop knobs because it doesn't control anything on the organ at all. There is nothing in the organ that is controlled by this. Likewise, there are two sets of um, stops here over on my left and then also here. They're totally blank. You can see they're just white. They don't have any writing on them. These are completely uh, non-functioning. And it is impossible to imagine that anybody would have said, let's add extra stops for future additions to the organ, because there is no extra room up there in that chamber. That chamber is jam-packed full of pipes. There's no adding anything extra. Um, in fact, our restoration is going to remove some of the pipes that were added in the 80s. None of the original pipes will be removed, but some of the less successful and the less useful will either be removed or repurposed. So there's no extra space. There's nothing here that could be added in the chamber. So what we have is we have what I call prime real estate on the console. I want everything to be as close to the music rack as possible, as clearly in my peripheral, uh, field of peripheral vision and by placing non-functioning stops here and here on the organ console, it pushes everything that is functioning that I do use all the way out to my right, all the way out to my left. So that if I want to pull a stop on the positive while I'm playing, I have to reach all the way over here. And you may say, well, that's uh, <laughs> not such a terrible thing as... Um, matters go, but it's very, very inconvenient to have to pull and turn while you're actually playing. The whole idea is that everything should be in reach. So were we to bring everything in closer, it would be a lot more um, functional and a lot more uh, efficient. The other thing is this control box on my left, and I know you can't see this if you're watching on camera. But this is the control box for our combination solid state action. This helps us to set and control all of the pipes and stops on the organ through these white buttons on the manuals, underneath the manuals, and then these black buttons. They do the same thing. They're just colored black for the feet and white for the, for the hands. These allow us to preset various combinations of stops and pipes. And that's all controlled over here. It is absolutely the most inconvenient, and anybody who, would, anybody who would start a console design to begin with would never put it over on the left, because as I'm playing, as the organist is playing, you want to be able to see all of that directly uh, in front of you. So good console design um, requires and calls for this kind of mechanism, this kind of readout, this kind of digital display of wh what level I'm on, what piston I'm using, um, 
should all be here in the center. And there's a great science of console design, and this is clearly added afterward because there was no room here originally in whatever console um, this was. And I know this isn't uh, happy news for a lot of people to hear, but it's important that we understand what the uh, limitations of this console are and the difficulties that come uh, in trying to play it um, in, a musical, uh, in a musical way. So there are mechanisms here on the, on the, on the key jams that are completely um, non-functioning. They have no effect whatsoever. Um, lots of little things about the console that make it um, less uh, efficient and less desirable than a console that was designed specifically for this instrument, this set of pipes in this particular space. That is the end of my presentation. Um, and I invite your questions about what I have said, about the restoration project, anything that comes to your mind that is of interest to you um, about this um, instrument and about what we're preparing to do. And Rita. Good question. So Rita's asking, when we say organ, what do we mean by the organ? We mean everything. We mean the console and we mean the pipes. And so some organ consoles are built into a case that has all the, ca all the pipes connected mechanically. In an electric action instrument here, we have the control mechanism, the, the uh, console, which is connected to the pipes which are up in the chamber. But when we talk about the organ, we're talking about everything. We're talking about keyboards, and we're talking about pipes. Right, good. So there are several, right, so there are several different kinds of pipe constructions. Okay, and very um, quickly and very um, simply, there are f flue pipes and re pipes. And flue pipes are activated by wind that comes up through the bottom of the pipe and creates a standing wave of oscillation um, through the mouth of the pipe and up through the pipe into its uh, it, it creating an oscillating column of air. And these are the most basic sounds of organs. Some are wider, some are narrower. The wider ones sound like this. But those are all flue pipes, okay? Um, those are different from the other major construction, which are reeds. They actually have a beating reed. Thank you for coming. Thanks for coming. Uh, and those are, for lack of a better word, the more, um, the more brassy. They're big reeds and then they're small reeds. This is the clarinet. A more gentle, but those are activated by air passing through a, a reed on a block. Um, and um, those are the two different kinds of, of uh, organ pipes in, in, a very, in a very brief way. Does that help? It, it, it's, it's, as I said, it's the most improbable instrument that has ever been created. Rita. No, these are brass reeds that, that um, uh, brass reeds that vibrate on a um, metal uh, shallot uh, under pressure, under pressure. So they are very, very fast beating um, of, the, of the reed, and then there is a, a pipe that goes up above that, but the, 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 um, that simply is what we call a resonator. Okay, so the sound is actually produced at the reed level, and then that sound is resonates through wood or through metal um, uh, structures above that look like 
the same kinds of pipes of the, that are the flue pipes, um, but their, their function is completely different. On the flue pipes, the sound is actually made in the column of the, of, of the uh, pipe itself, whereas the reed pipes are made, the sound is made at the reed, and the, uh, the sound resonates um, uh, through the uh, structure, the resonator that's supplied above it. David. Great question, yes. So in the early 1980s, um, I believe it was 82 or 83, um, I think what precipitated the original major um, renovation uh, and alteration to the instrument was a water event, um, a leak that came into the chamber, some things were um, damaged, and the uh, decision was made to do some renovation and some updating. So this, is a, this gets into some cultural things. The Wicks Organ Company came in and tried to update um, this organ to make it sound more um, classical, more, more Baroque. Um, this organ as it originally was designed was not designed to play Bach. It was designed to imitate an orchestra. It was designed for orchestral um, uh, transcriptions. From a tonal point of view, the, the concept of this organ, yes, it's a church organ, but it's a tonal concept, and this was very much a product of the day. This is what was going on at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Organs tried to imitate symphony orchestras, large symphony orchestras. And that had certain implications about how the organ sounded and what it could, how it could function, and the kinds of music that it could play most authentically. And so by the time we got to the middle to the end of the 20th century, it was desired to have what simply should be called a brighter sound. All right, so Wicks came in and tried to alter the tonal character of this instrument, which I'm not saying was necessarily perfect at, you know, or ideal at the particular time. But the way in which they did that is they removed pipes that they felt were no longer useful in um, realizing that kind of tonal ideal. Uh, in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, we were rediscovering um, Eastern Europe, Eastern um, uh, uh, German instruments that hadn't, we hadn't had access to for a long time and there was a concept of what those instruments should be and um, how we could remake instruments at that time, 60 years old, um, into that uh, style of instrument. So Wix took out many of the flue pipes of this organ and replaced them with a variety of different um, solutions um, to achieve that goal. What we are planning to do in this restoration uh, is to reintroduce several of those sounds. It's difficult these days to find those pipes again in uh, <laughs> secondhand uh, organ, organ supply places. So what we've done is the company that we are using is skilled and highly successful in reproducing a lot of these, in, of these pipes from the early Skinner days and they have all of the measurements. The, this, is, this is easily accessible, um, and it's a widespread understanding of what we call the scales of these pipes were. What the ratio of length to diameter were, and they're able to reproduce with extraordinary um, accuracy and beauty um, many of these uh, previous pipes. So that's what we're planning to do with um, some of the uh, 
pipes that were taken out. We, have, we know exactly what was taken out. We know exactly what was there. And we're going to put a lot of that back into uh, place, if that answers the question to some degree. How long have I been playing the organ? I've been playing the organ for, I'm not going to tell you how old I am. Uh, yeah, over 40 years. I was five when I started. Yeah, long time, long time. Clarence. I'm sorry, Clarence, could you? That's something that we can definitely, the, the question is, can we get some visuals from the chamber so we have a real understanding of what some of these pipes look like and what the inside of the chamber uh, looks like. It's jam-packed in there, and one of the plans for the restoration is to reconfigure the case, to reconfigure the chamber so that maintenance is much easier and that some of the pipes and some of the divisions will sound more effectively and more directly um, into the, the nave of the church. That's part of the plan. But it's an excellent suggestion, Clarence, that we try to give as much visual um, uh, understanding of how things go. Thanks for being here, Rita. So our process now is we are beginning the fundraising um, phase of the project. Um, we hope to have, uh, we hope to encourage people to contribute over a three year period, 2022, 23, 24. That by the end of 24, um, we will have completed the restoration. We, are, we have our company, the Schantz Organ Company of Oroville, Ohio, has been selected for this work. As soon as we have the money that we need pledged for this uh, uh, project, we'll sign a contract, they'll begin the work, and then uh, it is once they actually begin, once they actually take the pipes out, bring everything to their shop in Orville, Ohio, the process and the project is uh, from beginning to end, final reinstallation and final voicing is expected to be between 14 and 16 months. So uh, we are um, coming up to a little bit of a, a time um, concern, time crunch here. So we want to have the money uh, raised as soon as possible so we can sign the contract as soon as possible, wait our turn in line, because just because we sign a contract doesn't mean they don't have anything else to do, um, and then hopefully have it completed by uh, 2024. That's our. That's our goal at this particular point. People will begin to... Right, as long as we have, our, our, our hope is that as long as we have the pledges in hand, um, and uh, <clears throat> we'll also be taking bequests, so if we have irrevocable um, trust donations, we can uh, take that to the bank, shall we say, and um, begin uh, the process of the actual restoration. Um, but Absolutely. One of the things that we haven't been able to do recently um, is use the organ in a lot of public um, performances because it's been so unpredictable, and frankly, it just doesn't sound professional. It doesn't sound um, in a way that would attract outside groups, as you're suggesting. So yes, we, we absolutely could um, use the organ much more reliably and uh, much more um, uh, frequently than it has been. I mean, it basically hasn't been for um, the recent time. So again, we've had this series of patchwork 
repairs and one thing laid on top of another. And uh, uh, if you go online to opus414.org, you'll see some of the pictures that we have. Literally, there are pipes that are being held together with duct tape. Um, and so that's not a situation in which you invite people in um, and uh, <laughs> encourage them to use the instrument uh, because it's just, uh, it's just not viable. So much more will be possible with this, uh, with this restoration. Well, I know it's, again, uh, I've s said this before, and I will say it again, a lot of people, uh, the comment was, thank you for being a good steward, and it's my honor and my pleasure to be here to be able to do this. It is also, um, I feel a resp my responsibility as the caretaker, as the custodian of this instrument, to be very honest with the congregation um, about what is coming down the pike. And what's coming down the pike is, um, further deterioration, further um, limitation on what the organ is capable of doing. And just as most of us would not wait for our cars or any other devices that we have to grind to a halt before we would consider replacing them or repairing them, the time has come that we need to do this. I, I, I don't want to over-dramatize the um, silencing of the solo division of the organ, but it's it is major, and it's really unfortunate. And uh, it, it moves the organ into a, a category of, of musical instrument that is functional but completely um, uninspiring uh, at this particular point. Uh, we're all used to listening to the, the big solo reed, and we get used to it, but it's not there anymore. And that's going to continue to uh, occur, and. Uh, our time is now, it needs to be done. Uh, the contract price that we were given by this company four years ago, and we all know what's happened in between there, between now and then, then and now, but uh, it's $100,000 more than it was four years ago for a whole variety of reasons. And that's just gonna continue to go up and up. So it's important for us, I think, to seize the moment now to make the investment in our church, to make the investment in this place in the city um, for this extraordinary instrument. And it is an extraordinary instrument. The decision was made to renovate and not replace for artistic and for um, economic reasons. Uh, it would be much more expensive and we would lose some of the sounds which are um, iconic and are very, very difficult and extraordinarily expensive to replace. The good news is that, speaking about reeds, all of the original reeds on the organ are still present. And this is, um, you know, if you have to balance flues against reed, I guess the reeds are the more expensive um, uh, parts of the organ, the stops of the organ, and we have all those originals. So they need to be renovated, they're falling apart, they're deteriorating, but they can be restored. And so rather than throwing those out and just starting all over with something new, um, our decision is to renovate, and we believe that that will give us a superior artistic result and will be less costly um, by a factor of almost uh, 50%. Anything else? There's a lot more, and, and uh, but anyway, I'm so grateful for your presence here today. Opus414.org is our um, online presence, and there will be more uh, there, and you'll hear more about the uh, specifics about the fundraising. Opus414.org. And there is a link, thank you, there is a link on the homepage of the church website in the upper right-hand corner, I believe. Thanks for telling us about that. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for being here.